This podcast is brought to you by Most Valuable Podcasts, leading the league in podcasting entertainment. What's up, what's up, real MVPs, Ricky Whitmer here, along with the one, the only, Brandon Swanee Swanson. Hey, hey, hey. And we are back for another edition of the Primetime Podcast right here on Most Valuable Podcast, your one-stop shop for college sports, mainly college basketball and college football. And Brandon, we are, it's finally begun. We are one week, well, not completely. We record this on Monday, so this week's the weird one. We still got one game left tonight, Virginia Tech and Florida State. But week one is in the books for most teams. It's great to see football back on the docket. And because of that, we got a jam-packed show. Going to get into those topics in a little bit before. Going to give you a little bit of housekeeping. Number one, check out patreon.com backslash most available podcast. Going to have Matt on a little bit for this first segment so you can be like him if you check out that down below. You can also get our t-shirt down below into the shop. Looks great. Black t-shirt, MVP logo. You also get it at mostvailablepodcast.com where you can catch MVP each and every day. And last but not least, I didn't check, but I'm assuming we're a couple of good old boys still, Brandon, and that's the only review on iTunes. Make sure to go over to iTunes and Apple Podcasts. You could please give us a five-star rating. It would mean the world to us, and then let us know how we're not a couple of good old boys because we are talking SEC today, but we're not really talking SEC all the podcast, so I wouldn't say we're a couple of good old boys, but that's where you guys come in and let people know why we are not. But we got a jam-packed show looking at Notre Dame, Michigan from this past week. How does it shape the college football playoff picture? We're going to look at LSU after their stomping of the Miami Hurricanes in last night's thriller in their opening game. And then we're going to take a look ahead to Clemson and Texas A&M if an upset could be brewing in week two. And then we will end the podcast making our week two picks, but we're going to welcome on for this first topic for Michigan and Notre Dame. Got to welcome in one of our loyal patrons, Matthew. And Matt, the first question I'm just going to ask you real plain and simple, along with how you're doing, is you're doing okay after that Purdue game, right? You're you're doing okay after that tough loss to Northwestern? Yeah, I'm hanging in there. Um, I had the opportunity to witness it in person, and it was, it was a fun atmosphere, cool way to kick off the college football season obviously a little frustrating in then but um season isn't lost there's still a lot to be played and they they hung tough with a, a pretty good northwestern team so we'll we'll just have to recover from there well and like we were talking about before we hit the record button the thing that i had asked you was if you were upset because i know i was upset watching how that game ended because i'm a kind of guy i like i like things to be ended on the field if it was a long pass breakup that ended the game that's fine, but when it's a penalty and a, to me, dumb mistake, that's where it just gets my blood boiling. But let's look at the game that we're going to talk about now in Michigan-Notre Dame where the Wolverines go into South Bend, and this was a game, Brandon, that you and I had talked about. We previewed the Fighting Irish. There were Fighting Irish fans that were really, I'm going to say me more than you because I've been the most down on Notre Dame this offseason, but... The Fighting Irish get the win 24 to 17. Shea Patterson didn't have his best game. I know he came out of the game. You had Dylan McCaffrey come in for a little bit, and it looked like they were getting Shea Patterson and IV in the locker room to get him back out, and he did finish the game. Brandon Wimbush looked great for the Fighting Irish. The defense looked amazing for this Fighting Irish team. Matt, I'm going to go to you first. Starting with Notre Dame, how do you think this win? What are you thinking of Notre Dame right now, and how is this going to shape the playoff picture for Notre Dame getting a win over the Wolverines? So I guess I should just be frank and upfront in that I'm not a huge Notre Dame person. Go figure. Um, <laughs> but uh, no, I thought I I didn't see the whole thing, but from what I did see, I thought that they they did perform fairly well. Um, I thought they really came out and punched Michigan um, right out of the get go, and that kind of set the tone. And then I think. You saw a lot of positives, both offensively and defensively, from them. So to get that win, especially at home, underdogs, which I kind of surprised me, but to get that win um, over what's supposed to be a good Michigan team is obviously a good way um, to start off the season. I think that for Notre Dame, what it did on Saturday night, it was it, it proved to people that 
it's okay that Quentin Nelson and Mike McGlinchey moved on to the NFL. They're going to be okay. They're going to be all right. Mm -hmm. Uh, Brandon Wimbush had time to throw. Armstrong had lanes to run through. I mean, he specifically talked about uh, being able, I think on his 13-yard scamper to the end zone, said, you know, it's really these guys doing it up front that are allowing me to do this. And that's going to continue, I would like to think, throughout the year. Again, you start off a a test against a, a, a what is supposed to be an improved Michigan team and a pretty darn good Michigan defense that we saw last year. I think that Notre Dame with withstood a, a pretty good test and and finishing it off by recovering that fumble in the final minute of the game. That was a huge thing defensively for for Notre Dame. But I think that this team, this Notre Dame team, is going to be good going down the stretch. But if you want to talk about playoff hopes and outlooks and things like that, people were already putting Notre Dame, and I I do uh, like Notre Dame. They were already putting Notre Dame in their early season playoff picture. Mm -hmm. I don't necessarily want to say that you can do that right away because if you were just putting every team in the top 25 that won their first game Mm -hmm. and putting them into the playoff picture, I, I mean, that would be kind of silly. So you look at Notre Dame winning, that's great. They start off on a better foot than what Michigan's going to but you look at what Notre Dame's got the, kind of the rest of the way. They've, they're have they going to have what should be an easy game this week against Ball State. But then you've got, coming up soon, in uh, at, right at the end of September, you've got Stanford at home, then on the road at Virginia Tech. Then you've got a, a couple of weeks with Pittsburgh Navy at Northwestern, and clearly they're no slouch of a team. Mm-hmm. And then you come home against Florida State, you end on the road at USC. So you still have a number of tests if you're Notre Dame. And it was, I mean, they're, they're in a better position than Michigan is because they got the win here in week one. But I, I still think that there's a lot for Notre Dame to have coming their way, but week one getting that win against Michigan, I think they look good and they they start off on a, on a good foot. Well, and the thing that I was looking at when you and I previewed Notre Dame was basically all the tough matchups that they had, where it was you got Michigan to start, you get a team like Stanford who's 13th ranked before the new rankings come out tomorrow, Virginia Tech top 20 team, Florida State top 20 team, and then you have USC, that's a top 15 team. And the thing that I want to point out to people is some people might say, well, ooh, like, for example, Stanford and USC, those could be winnable games because, like, you know, USC was playing UNLV and they only led 19-14 to 14 going into the half. And then San Diego State and Stanford was only a 9-7 to seven game for the Cardinal heading into halftime. A lot of this first week of the season – is second half adjustments. Like when it comes to the first half, most of those games, the two that I mentioned, ended up being 31 to 10 for Stanford. They just turned it on in the second half. Same thing for the Trojans. All 24 of their second half points coming in the fourth quarter, but they then blew out the Rebels 43 to 21. So a lot of these teams take it with a grain of salt because it's a lot of seeing what we got, kind of using that first half as kind of a buffer. And then, boom, off to the races. Usually they find it and they make those adjustments at halftime. But I will say, based off of what I've seen from Notre Dame in Game 1, and I know it's only one game and this is where we make our kind of overreactions for the season. We really overreact to Week 1 no matter what season it is. But, like, now I look at these games and there's some of them. Like, maybe Stanford. All right. If that defense shows up to what it did right now, maybe that's a winnable game. Now, Florida State and Virginia Tech, we have technically, as we're recording this, have not seen them play as they play tonight. But depending on how those teams work, maybe those turn into winnable games. Northwestern, to me, yeah, that's going to be on the road at Northwestern. But I feel like the Northwestern team we saw in Week 1 if that went up against the Notre Dame defense, that Notre Dame team, that maybe Notre Dame wins that game now, and then USC, that one's the, I'm going to say that one's still going to be tough because it's in the Coliseum. If that one was in South Bend, I would be favoring the Irish at this point. I'm not on the side of, hey, let's put them in the playoffs. Oh, they're going to win every game. But there's a little bit of me now is now a little bit more favorable in the sense of, hey, you know what? 
maybe they have a better chance to win these games. Maybe some of these that I thought were going to be for sure losses, maybe those turn into kind of possibilities to win. And Matt, I'm going to go with you and ask you this. Looking at, I'm just going to look at the ranked ones right now. Stanford, Virginia Tech, Florida State, um, USC. We'll even throw Northwestern in there because that's one of the prime teams that they're playing. Do you think, would you be more on the, hey, let's not overreact to week one? Or are you looking at it going, hey, you know what? Maybe they now become more favorable in these games because of what we saw against Michigan. I'd probably go with a little bit of both. I mean, I think there, you saw a lot of positives, and I think for that reason, and just looking at those opponents, that you could say, yeah, there's there's reason to think that they can win those games, or at least you know that that the, be them be toss ups or something like that. Um, however, I mean, I guess even if you look kind of back to Notre Dame last year, right? They were kind of, I think, maybe even a sim, in a similar situation out of the gate there, where they got off to a good start. Um, but then um, just, you know, had a couple of losses down the road that knocked them out of the playoff. I guess Notre Dame becomes a unique situation, especially with them not being in the conference, right? The, the whole conference championship thing comes into play with them. So I think with them, I mean, they really do kind of have to run the table or at least a little more is expected of them um, for that reason. So as far as playoff implications go, I think, you know, I, I, I hear those, those games and not having seen everyone played, but I think they certainly have a chance to run the table now. And that doesn't seem too crazy, but um, I, I think we need to see a little more too um, than just week one to, to make that judgment. You're definitely always going to have to look at more than week one. Uh, that, that That is uh, usually not the best indicator of what the rest of the season could be as we've seen in the past, but moving over to Michigan and moving over to the Big Ten East. Uh, the top dogs in the Big Ten East certainly did not look like top dogs this past weekend. Penn State barely skates by Appalachian State mm-hmm. in overtime, and M- Michigan State barely skates by in their game, 38-31. to Against Utah State. Uh, Ohio State, you shouldn't be excited that you scored 77 points. You played Oregon State, you should be more worried you gave up 31 points. And then I'm going to fight you on that one a little bit. The only thing I'm going to say is be excited for that 77 because of how the offense looked, although I will agree with you that the 31 to Oregon State is too high. But the offense for Ohio State looked in midseason but, form. But, but don't be excited. It's Oregon mm-hmm. State, so calm down. Um, but then the thing that I would say... Matt, is then if you look at Michigan's schedule now, they're going to be go, they're going to be going through a, you know a couple of games coming up. They're going to be going against a, the, the the teams that I think are going to be interesting, which are most of them. Uh, Nebraska. If you talk to Nebraska fans, they think that they're going to win like most games this season, mm-hmm. which I think is a little over the top, uh, but they're going to be certainly moving. Uh, and, and I think the, the the right direction on the road at Northwestern will be a tough game. Maryland could be a tough game because of how they played Texas in, in week one. Then you've got Wisconsin. Wisconsin is going to be very good. But then you got on the road at Michigan State and home against Penn State. Now, those games before this week, I would have said, you know, those are those are, in my opinion, they're, they're most likely going to be losses for Michigan. But after the way that both Michigan State and Penn State played this last week, I would say Michigan has a, a, has a, has a definite fighting chance in mm-hmm. both of those games. And then, obviously, the game on the road at Ohio State to, to end the season. And, you, I, I mean, I, I won't even count out the Indiana game. So, man, I want to throw it to you, and especially being the, the, the Big Ten buff that, that you are. Looking at that, do you see a really tough road possibly tumultuous road for Michigan or do you think that this could be one where week one wasn't good a lot of people are down on them but they come out of the quote-unquote cellar and they actually surprise people throughout the year what do you think you know I guess uh, and as far as Michigan goes kind of using last year's results too I'm kind of you know low on them I, I really don't think they lived up to expectations last year and I think how they came out of the gate this year doesn't help um, to kind of change my mind so 
I think looking at the schedule too, I mean, as, as far as their crossover games, as I'm sure you guys kind of hit on in the preview, I mean, they've got two of the tougher teams and yes, they host Wisconsin, but Wisconsin obviously is a top four team. And then, um, Northwestern as well, who's basically established themselves now as the second best team in the West. So having those two games too as your crossover certainly doesn't help an already brutal schedule being in the East. So, um, I'm, I'm pretty concerned. I mean, I don't, I, I wouldn't put it past that this, if it, you know, if this really goes really bad, that they could be like a 500 type team. I don't think that will happen, but I, I could see a scenario where it would. And I think, um, at that point, Harbaugh is going to, you know, if he's not already gone, he's going to be on the hottest coals available. So that's kind of where I'm at, I guess. And that's, I just really quickly Mm -hmm. before, before Ricky, uh, you know, takes off here is that that's what I wanted to, to, to make mention to as well is not that I, I don't want to say that Michigan is going to, you know, be a, 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 a crummy team throughout the rest of the season. I'm not going to say that, but let's say that they do really struggle. Let's say that they're only a game or two over 500 Michigan fans who said, who after listening to Ricky and I talk about if Harbaugh does not win this year, and I'm not talking win win it all go to the you know national championship game or anything but if he doesn't win the east if he doesn't make the playoffs if he doesn't if they don't show progress from last year's down year will he be on the hot seat and i said yes and then fans of course uh you know ripped me and ripped ricky and i and said 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 the only way that harbaugh is on the hot seat is if they go zero and 12 and now yeah, I mean, you'd really be on a hot seat if you go 0 and 12. But also at the same time, is he? Because Michigan, and and, and this is uh, this is just me thinking in the last couple of weeks, and certainly after this game, is who better would Michigan be going after? I mean, a lot of the the really good head coaches now they got scooped up and signed mm-hmm. to long term deals this past season. And now they're with their respective teams. Jimbo Fisher's going to be, of course, uh, over at Texas A&M for 10 years, right? Because we all know that he'll end his career there, But unless some th- other good deal comes along. But who else would they go with? So right now it's almost they continue to ride Harbaugh out and just let him figure it out because they they know what kind of recruiter he is and everything like that. So so Matt, just going you know back to that, you know, even if he is on the hot seat, would they? Do you think they would even look to if he's on the media hot seat? Is he really on the school's hot seat? Yeah, I mean that. No, you're 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 right. I think that always needs to be considered, sort of, of uh, if we got rid of him, what better could we do? Sort of situation. I think too many times that's not taken into account, and there's sort of this um, too quick of a reaction to, to to want to get rid of the guy without any forward thinking on. You know, are we actually going to get any better? So, no, I mean, that's definitely a valid point. But I just, I don't know. I'm just, I guess I'm not a Michigan fan, but just knowing the expectations that come with that program, it seems to me like the way he struggled in the big game so far, I don't, I thought I saw a graphic that maybe he's like three and six versus, you know, some of the upper tier teams in the, the big 10 East. That that's not going to cut it, and I mean, at what point do you draw that line? And say enough is enough, and that we're not going to accept that. I don't know. Maybe that's not this year. Maybe it is, but I I think at some point they're kidding themselves if they don't if if they they say that they're going to be happy with the results that have been produced at this point. Well, it's like the first thing I looked at when you pull up the ESPN page for Michigan is there was a um, little bit of I guess. They were talking to Paul Feinbaum um, today, and the quote just goes, Feinbaum, Harbaugh wasn't brought to Michigan to lose to ND. And I've gone through just Harbaugh's seasons with Michigan. So year one, and I'm just doing rivals, by the way. Year one, Michigan State, Ohio State, he's 0-2. The next year, he's 0-2. So now he's 0-4. After that third year, he beats Michigan State, but loses to Ohio State. He's now one and five. And wasn't that Michigan State team a three and nine Michigan State team? I believe so. Yeah. Yes. So he is now what would that be? One and five. Then last year loses to Michigan State in Ann Arbor, 
loses to Ohio State in Ann Arbor, one and eight. Now you tack on the week one loss. He is one and nine, one and nine against rivals at Michigan. And you can say whatever you want with the oh well, Jim Harbaugh has a good record at Michigan. He's twenty eight and twelve in Michigan. He's eighteen and eight in the conference. He's got a winning record. But here's the ultimate thing that I think happens, and this week one loss doesn't hurt. Michigan's chances in the Big Ten because I think that Matt hit a good point with Notre Dame that can be flipped on the Michigan side. If they play well in the Big Ten and they win the Big Ten, and let's say this is the only loss at the end of the year, we will be sitting here looking at them as a playoff team, especially if, let's say, Notre Dame, if they go undefeated and Michigan only has this one loss— then the committee, the big argument will be, yeah, they have a one loss, but Notre Dame, they're an undefeated team. They're a playoff team, so can you really hold it against them? Or let's say they lose to they lose in like the title game. And one of the big things I know I was talking to Dave on Friday, and he was like, oh, in college football, I think we're going to get two teams from the Big Ten in the playoff. Where I'm like, I don't know. I would put my money on the SEC getting two in over the Big Ten, but... My biggest problem with the whole Harbaugh debate and conversation right now is if I had to look into my crystal ball, and I'm not saying it's going to be this year, I'm not saying it's going to be next year, based off of what I have seen, the same thing will happen to Harbaugh, which happened to Lovey Smith and the Bears. The only difference, Lovey Smith came in with Chicago and was really good against against the rival. He came in and said, we're going to beat the Packers. And at first he did. The Bears were starting to beat the Packers, and it felt nice for Bears fans. But then you look at his last one, two, I want to say four seasons, only one win against the Packers. And when the Bears fired him, I I believe it was a 10-6 and six, Yeah, it was a 10-6 and six season, but they cited, you can't beat the Packers, and we got to beat the Packers, this team – is going nowhere. I feel like Jim Harbaugh, not this year, maybe not next year, maybe the year after, it'll be, yeah, you're an 8-10 to win coach, but if you can't beat the Notre Dames, if you can't beat the Michigan States, if you can't beat the Ohio States, that is eventually going to sit in the craw of the Board of Trustees, alumni, current students, to where it's like, I don't care if we're winning 10 games a year. We're not in the playoff discussion because we can't beat Michigan State. We can't beat Ohio State. And even if we could, we can't beat Notre Dame. And that's just going to irritate this fan base eventually in my mind. I think the biggest thing for Michigan right now, bigger than even thinking about what could happen with Harbaugh, it's are they – Set with Shea Patterson as their starting quarterback. Yes, that is that's the that's the number one thing moving forward. Mm-hmm. Is is he going to? Is this what we're what we're? Is this what Michigan's going to get from Shea Patterson throughout the season? And the answer that most Michigan fans would say is no, absolutely not. But he has got to feel more comfortable mm-hmm. than he did last week especially if he's going up against good defenses. He's going to have to feel comfortable. He's going to have to be able to make some of the good passes and the tough passes and complete them and make some of the big plays. Those were things that he wasn't able to have on Saturday night. There were no big plays. There were a few, but well, they weren't but, but, like But all I, the I'm time. talking about like what lead to points. Mm-hmm. I mean, what, what ultimately leads to points and leads to wins. And that's just not necessarily what he was able to do. Mm -hmm. And for me, I look at Matt, before I go back to you, the thing that's a good thing is like, first, when you ask that question, Brandon, are they set with Shea Patterson? I'm going to be honest, get that, get that stuff out of the studio. We are not having a quarterback debate here on the podcast. Shea Patterson will be the starting quarterback unless he's injured for the entire year at Michigan. The good thing though, that I look at is like you mentioned Nebraska. Well, we, ha- we can't overreact to Nebraska because I guess that their game got canceled on Saturday. Akron didn't want to play on Sunday, so the game just got canceled. We'll wait to see 
what they do in their first game this upcoming week. But I mean, they got Michigan as Nebraska as their first Big Ten conference game. And then immediately after, Northwestern, Maryland, who played well against Texas. Matt Canada, I think, is going to do good things with Maryland. And then they've got Wisconsin, Michigan State, Penn State. Everyone coming into week one, into Saturday night's game, was like, Michigan's got the hardest schedule. They got the hardest schedule. But the good thing for me is we will see Shea Patterson improve because they've got Western Michigan coming up next. They got SMU after that. If they lose any of those two games, like the season on fire, let's look to next year. But I feel like these two games will be ones where, all right, Shea Patterson can get into a rhythm because like when you're playing in practice, it's a lot different than playing into a game. And when you're a transfer coming into Michigan, all the pressure on the offseason that we've put on Shea Patterson's shoulders of like, oh, the first great or the first good quarterback that Jim Harbaugh has had, he's gonna be the reason Jim Harbaugh can get to the college football playoff. It puts a lot of pressure on you. And then you gotta go up and play Notre Dame in Notre Dame. So I'm looking at it as let's see these next two against lesser opponents and see if they can build off of. Because there were good things from Shea Patterson in that game. They had one big long pass in the first half that I really liked. But there were times where it's like, oh, the pressure's coming. Shea Patterson gets it out quick. And if he can do that more, he'll be successful. Matt, I guess what I'm going to ask you is, when it comes to that Nebraska game, is because we're saying that there's a possibility that Nebraska could be a better team this year with Scott Frost. Do you think we'll see improvement from Shea Patterson in the next two games before Michigan hits conference play on September 22nd? Yeah, I would suspect so. I mean, let's uh, obviously we would expect that Notre Dame's defense is probably a heck of a lot better than the next two defenses he's going to play. So for that reason alone, yeah, I think you should see better numbers. And if you don't, then um, there there should be concern there. Um, as far as his performance on Saturday against Notre Dame, I mean, I, I think he, he looked all right. The numbers um, indicate that he did okay. But to, to kind of the Brandon's point as far as, you know, leading the points, I mean, Michigan, I mean, let's not forget that Michigan – had a kickoff return for a touchdown that accounted for seven of those points, right? So, mm-hmm. I mean, they they really had three points until, what, pretty late into the fourth quarter, at least offensively, directly from the offense. So, I think that that, that is still a little bit concerning. Um, but, yeah, let's let's see how, how the offense progresses through these next two weeks, and then maybe that gives them the boost they need and the confidence um, to get everything clicking um, by conference conference schedule season and Brandon before I ask you your final thoughts before we move on I want to ask you this question when it comes to the putting points on the board because that's important you got to put points on the board to win the game is that how you win thanks John Madden but is that more of a Shea Patterson like or should we put the fault for that on Shea Patterson or Jim Harbaugh is it a scheme thing and the offense not being able was it not calling the right plays, putting Shea Patterson in the right situation, or just Shea Patterson not being able to make the plays with the plays that were called from Jim Harbaugh on the sidelines? Well, when you first asked the question, I was going to give the smart-ass answer of, well, Jim Harbaugh's not on the field, Mm -hmm. so obviously it would be Shea Patterson. Um, I think it's it's more on Shea Patterson. We know what he can do. I mean, he needs to be Ole Miss Shea Patterson. That's who Michigan was excited to be getting. Mm-hmm. Someone who is very capable, has a good arm, uh, you know, is 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 an accurate passer and can really heave the deep the deep ball and and the, it leads to points. That's what Shea Patterson needs to be able to do. And when your offense really and and again, I don't want to take away anything from Notre Dame's defense and say that it was all Shea Patterson struggling mm-hmm. on his own. Notre Dame's defense was very good. I mean, they they had a lot of stops. They had a lot of key stops. They did a, they did a great job on Saturday. Mm-hmm. Notre Dame's defense did. But again, Shea Patterson, if he's this quarterback that a lot of people are and were expecting, he has got to rise above all of that, and he's got to be better. 
That's exactly what has to happen. He just has to flat out be better. These next two games should give him the opportunity to do that because they're going to be lesser defenses than what Notre Dame was. Mm -hmm. But hopefully he'll be able to figure it out in those two games because I I think that once it gets into the conference, there really will not be an easy game. Well, and Matt, I'll ask you, what are your final thoughts on this to kind of put a final bow on both Michigan and Notre Dame? So I think Notre Dame, um, obviously get, getting that win, it's kind of a resume builder, or at least you're hoping it is. So I think it's a definitely a good start for them um, as they, especially, you know, in terms of looking into playoff contention. So I think that got them off on the right foot. And as far as Michigan, your season isn't lost. Um, there's, there's reason for concern, um, even though it is early, but – there's also opportunity to kind of correct some of that, and you've got enough worthy opponents on your schedule that you don't necessarily need to think the playoffs out of the picture if you can, can run the table and get to the conference championship and such. So um, not all is lost, but definitely um, need to see some improvement here in the coming weeks. Yeah, and I mean the last thing I'll say is kind of to go off the question that I had asked you, Brandon, is – I'm going to say it's a little bit of column A, column B, but I'm putting more of that, a little bit more of the chips into that column B, which would be the Jim Harbaugh, because the only reason why is, yes, we should have expected some struggle from Shea Patterson. First time he's being in this offense in a real game and that defense for Notre Dame, like you said, let's not take away anything from them because they were phenomenal in that first game, like watching it, my biggest takeaway after watching the first few plays was like, all right, all right, that uh, that coach we talked about when we were talking about new D.C. and uh, Notre Dame, all right, that really paid off. Good salary uh, that you paid him for this game. But, I mean, when I look back to the Notre Dame game now and all of Michigan State's losses last year, South Carolina, Ohio State, Wisconsin – Penn State, Michigan State. The most points that they scored in any of those games, including the one this week, 20. They had 10 against Michigan State, 13 against Penn State, 10 against Wisconsin, 20 against Ohio State, but maybe they played up a little bit for that one, and then 19 against the Gamecocks in their bowl game. Part of me is wondering if it if it's Shea Patterson's fault points weren't being put on the board, Or if Jim Harbaugh and this team, if it's just like they go up against good teams and Jim Harbaugh with the play calling and the coaching staff kind of shit the bed a little bit. So, I mean, I think it's – I'm not taking all the pressure off of and all the um, blame off of Shea Patterson. You're trying. But I think it's it's both column A, column B. Like, let's not – be like, oh, Jim Harbaugh had nothing to do with this. True, but a lot of it is about execution. I mean, I mm-hmm. think most sports people know that, and more, most players know that it's about execution. Mm-hmm. I mean, there's a lot of schemes that you can have work, and it's just about the execution of those schemes and having the right players fit for those schemes. And so the, that's, I mean, that's that's what I think. And the thing I would just say to combat that that's kind of like the devil's advocate is, yeah, you have to execute on the field, which is the player's, but the coaches have to put their players in the best situations and call the best plays that they think will have those shine. This is where I want to pass that question off to you guys, though, is first off, what do you think with like Notre Dame, Michigan State, and the playoff picture? But kind of this last question of like with Michigan's troubles, is it Shea Patterson's fault? Is it Jim Harbaugh's fault? What is Jim Harbaugh's future going to be if this season isn't a good year for Michigan? Michigan fans, how are you feeling after game one? Notre Dame fans, how are you feeling after game one? Let us know down below in that comment section. But Brandon, let's move on into our next topic. And we are taking a look at the LSU Tigers. This is a team, Brandon, that I'm going to say something. I know this is a line from the team we talked about in the first segment um, in the Michigan Wolverines, but I'm going to say it anyways. And LSU went out there and basically shocked the world. We going to shock the world. That is what they did against Miami, a team that both you and I picked last week 
to beat the Tigers in this one. I was even talking about, oh, if LSU loses their first two games, that Ed Orgeron could be on the hot seat, could be fired after two games. Well, Ed Orgeron's hot seat is getting a little bit colder, could be completely ice after this one. Joe Burrow, only 140 yards, no touchdowns, no INTs, but played fairly well in their first game. He also had 14 yards on the ground. And also Nick Brassett had 125 yards, two tutties. It's it's like Sean and Dave and I were talking uh, coming home from Mark's house after our fantasy football draft. It was It's like LSU just poops out running backs and cornerbacks. They've got now Brassett on the running back side. They got Greedy Williams, who I am in love with on the defensive side. I want to ask you this. Overreaction Monday here. Can LSU play surprise and upset either Alabama or Auburn this season when they play them later this year? I'm going to say no. I'm going to say no to your your surprise upset. Uh, Watching how Alabama played over the weekend, uh, they are just too good. Mm -hmm. They are just so good. And I understand that they were playing against Louisville team, a Louisville team that does not have Lamar Jackson. But... Alabama's defense looked really, really good uh, the in, the entire the entire game the entire game they looked good and offensively Alabama's going to be really solid and they're going to be solid with with Tua Tagovailoa mm-hmm. uh, and I don't even think I said that right Tagovailoa I've tried to say it so fast but you can't you have to slow down when you say it but I, I think that um, it's going to be a good season for Alabama and LSU while they are going to they look like they're going to be a team that will be similar to last year especially towards the end of the season mm-hmm. that's what that's what they look like this year or maybe Miami isn't as good as what they showed us last season maybe they're more like what they were at the end of the season but LSU played really well but beating Alabama and then even Auburn and Auburn didn't even play that well. Mm-hmm. I don't think Auburn really should have won the game against Washington. They did, and that's all that matters. But their defense, their defensive front seven, is the real deal. They are very good. They held Miles Gaskin, a guy who can break out in any game. They held him to 75 yards rushing. He didn't catch any passes. Mm-hmm. That's a that's a really good defense right there. They sacked Browning five times, and... Joe Burrow, who did not turn the ball over, that's the most important thing. He did not turn the football over, but he looked like Danny Etling 2.0 because he just didn't do a whole whole lot. And and, and again, I'm mm-hmm. not trying to say he didn't do a whole lot, you're, you're worthless, but it's like he didn't do a whole lot. But he didn't, he didn't lose he didn't, him the game. But that's what I wanted to say is that he mm-hmm. didn't lose him the game. He did not turn the football over, but for LSU to continue to win games, he's going to have to get more involved. They're going to have to open up the playbook a little bit more for him. But when you have guys running like like Nick Brossett, who looked extremely good, he would hit the hole and boom, off to the races. He had some great cuts in that game, just absolutely eluding defenders. Coming into the game, last year he had 19 carries for 96 yards. Mm-hmm. He had 22 carries for 125 yards and two touchdowns on Sunday night. I mean, that's absolutely impressive. This LSU team looks like they could be really good. Defensively, they look like they could be really good. They sacked Malik Rozier four times. They hurried him five times. And they they got some really good interceptions at, at critical points in the ball game. M- Rozier threw it away. I mean, threw it right to him mm-hmm. a number of times. He didn't look good. And, and I think that maybe the uh, Nikasi Perry talk needs to start up again even though uh, Miami fans may hate me for saying that if that's what you want from Rozier all season long that's what you might be getting Mm -hmm. but going to finish up the point of LSU I I just don't see him being able to beat Alabama being able to beat Auburn I think that both Bama and Auburn have better teams more sound teams and, and and better defenses well and defense is the big thing like Alabama were The thing that I think of is the only way that LSU is going to beat Alabama is if Alabama has like a game like the Mississippi State game last year. Oh, we're going on the road to Mississippi State. They only got Nick Fitzgerald. We should beat them. And then Mississippi State almost shocks the world and almost shocks them in the process if like 
if Nick Fitzgerald took a little bit of that mustard off that pass, it's a touchdown. Alabama loses a game. So, I mean, to me, I'm going to say yes. There is like, there is, it's kind of like what I said with Notre Dame, where, oh, these games that I thought would be losses now become winnable games for Notre Dame. These games, am I ready to say, boom, upset special? I'm going to push the button. Alabama, Auburn, you've been put on notice. I'm not going that far yet. But I will say the upset special barometer, the percentage, has gone up a little bit after this game. And the reason I say that is Alabama, like I said, they're going to be playing at LSU. That's the big reason why. You get Alabama coming to you. you rather play them in LSU, in Death Valley, rather than in Mobile, Alabama. For Auburn, yeah, you got them on the road, but there's a part of me, There's my brain is torn when it comes to the Auburn game because on one side, my brain says, there's no way Brosett is going to run like he did on that Auburn defense. I mean, Miles Gaskin only had 75 yards. Yeah, congratulations, Miles Gaskin. You're now the leading rusher in Washington history. I said during their preview, It'll happen on like his fifth rush of the game. It took a little bit more than that. But the point being, he did it in that first game. The defense for Auburn is really good. But, like you said, they probably should have lost that game to Washington. Like, that wasn't a sounding, commanding victory for the Auburn Tigers. It was more of a, wow, this defense is dominant from the start. Washington got back into it as second half adjustments happened. And then Auburn escaped with the victory in their first game. I would say if there's any team that they could upset, I kind of want to lean more towards Auburn. However, it's going to ride on the shoulders, I would say, of Joe Burrow. And the reason why I say that is looking at Washington, what did... What did Joe Burrow do well against Miami? Didn't turn over the ball. Like you said, like you look at the stats, uh, 140 yards about. He did nothing special. He did everything game manager-esque yes. Danny Etling style. But yet again, it's it's kind of like, and I'll compare it to Shea Patterson. Yeah, he didn't do, like he didn't, he wasn't flashy, but he didn't lose his team the game. He didn't turn over the ball. He didn't do any of that. Jake Browning was different in Auburn where He had almost 300 yards. Yeah, he only had one touchdown to one INT, but which was a bad INT, by the way. He wasn't just a game manager against Auburn. I know what you're saying, Ricky. Joe Burrow and Jake Browning are two completely different quarterbacks. Why are you putting them in the same breath? But there's a part of me that's, and maybe you can help me settle this debate because LSU also has a really good defense of their own. If LSU's defense can make Jarrett Stidham struggle just a little, is Auburn the one, out of the two, Auburn and Alabama, is Auburn the one that is more susceptible to a Tiger upset in two weeks rather than Alabama later in the year? Well, out of the two, yeah, I think Auburn would be more susceptible to it. I I think that Washington's defense proved that they were pretty good, too, mm-hmm. because there were a number of times. Except Auburn, for when they missed Auburn, Vita Vey up the middle. Auburn was able to, what Auburn did well, and I said this to my dad as as we were watching the, the, fir- the mm-hmm. first half of the game. Auburn was having their way with Washington between the 20s. Mm-hmm. But once they got to the 20 or inside the 20, they stalled. Mm-hmm. Washington's defense was kind of that bend but don't break. Mm-hmm. They bent all the way, you know, in the middle of the field and everything like that, but then they made sure they did not break when it got down into the red zone, and they forced multiple field goals, field goal after field goal after field goal, and mm-hmm. one Carlson even missed. Yeah. So I, I think that if that is the type of defense that LSU can play against Auburn, I think that they have a chance to be able to do it, to upset the Tigers, the Auburn Tigers. But I think that there's going to be more offense coming from, uh, certainly after this small sample size that we mm-hmm. saw of Joe Burrow. Yes, no turnovers, and he didn't. He did not cost his his team the game. That's fantastic because Malik Rozier may have. With but his, you're with have his to turnovers, make plays but to beat the Crimson you Tide or the Tigers. have to be able to make many plays. Mm-hmm. Not one, not two, many plays. And you have to be on your A game 
to be able to do that. Nick Brosette needs to be able to have a game like mm-hmm. that. But against both Alabama and against Auburn, I see that not being realistic. If you go for 125 yards and two touchdowns against either of those defenses, you've done something really well, or they just did not show up to the game. So LSU, maybe they do have a, a, a better chance against Auburn, but I still think that uh, looking at Auburn's front seven and what they were what they were able to do, the pressure that they got, the mm-hmm. energy that they had, they look really good. They look very good, and, and one of the best in the country for sure when all things are said and done, mm-hmm. I, I would guarantee that. And the thing that I also look at is, of course, we're looking at the reason why I didn't throw Georgia into the title for this, by the way, is mainly because Georgia's in the other side of the um, SEC. But I will ask you, are there any other games? Let's say, let's not look at Alabama and Auburn now. Let's look at some of the other games. So, like, Texas A&M had a really good week one. I know the opponent they played, but they looked really good with Jimbo Fisher in week one. you got Mississippi State, who's a top 20 team right now. You've got Georgia, who's a top five team right now at the moment. Are there any of these games that originally when we did the LSU preview way at the beginning of the offseason since the SEC was the first kind of conference that we hit, are there any of these games that before you were thinking, all right, probably a loss, that now after week one you might be flipping or you're like, hey, you know what, this is a game that could be more favorable to LSU than I had previously thought. Well, I think that games like Georgia, uh, games like Mississippi State, I think that those will be interesting games, especially mm-hmm. after what we saw on Sunday night from from LSU. And and I'm not going to say that that they're going to, uh, you know, have Georgia welcome the Bulldogs in and everything's going to be fine and dandy. But mm-hmm. you didn't really get a good sense of how Georgia's going to be either because they played Austin P. You exactly. know, you're you're not getting a good sense of that. And then with Mississippi State. You've got a great quarterback in Nick Fitzgerald. He was suspended for week one, but he's now back for the rest of the season, Mm -hmm. of course, barring any injury that would happen. But that's another game that I look at and I think, wow, you know, these are going to be back-to-back really good games. And LSU gets both of those really good opponents at home. They actually get three good opponents right in a row Mm -hmm. all at home. But that's a good thing. They're at home. That's what I'm trying to get at here. Thanks for spelling it out. But I, I think that that's going to be something that may come in to be a factor, that you're not traveling on the road for mm-hmm. any of these. You're able to stay in your spot. You don't have to travel. You don't have to, you know, go go through the, you know, go through all of that and, and, and be tired from from having to do that, go mm-hmm. on the road and anything like that. But but not like you're really going all that far. Yeah. But I, I think that for for those games, I would certainly put up the Here's here's one I would definitely look at. Here's one I would definitely look at mm-hmm. uh, with 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 those two, Texas A and M. If they can continue to show, uh, you know, with uh, Jimbo Fisher and um, Mond and everything like that, that that that's you know a a program and a system that is getting better, and it wasn't just a, a week one. Well, you know, this is who you play type of deal. Uh, week one in a lot of games. Didn't show a whole lot. Mm -hmm. There's more to talk about in a week one game after it was a Mm Washington-Auburn or a Michigan-Notre Dame. Yeah. Because those are two quality opponents playing each other. Or even an LSU-Miami. Or an an LSU-Miami, exactly. Mm -hmm. Like, you you started to get a little bit of a sense that LSU, they may be pretty pretty good this year. They may may be staying within the top 25 all season long, and they may be climbing up that ladder. Whereas after week one, you may look at Miami and go— what are they going to be? And I was going to ask this question with you just saying that is, I don't want to sound like I'm taking anything away from LSU, but the Miami LSU game, is it more of, are we right on track of like, was it all, ooh, LSU was really good, or was it, wow, Miami might not be who we think they are this year? Because, I mean, Miami is in a similar boat to what we – had talked about with Michigan in the first segment of, yeah, their college football hopes might be taking a little pinhole to the, uh, to the raft right there, but this is still a team that can do well in the ACC and still go to the ACC title game. Was this game more of a LSU looked really good and LSU's for real or a 
wow, Miami just does not look good and might not be who they thought we are, who we thought they were. Well, Miami prided itself on its defense. Turnover chain. Last season, mm-hmm. right? I mean, that's where they that's where they got their energy. That's a big reason why they won a number of their games, because mm-hmm. their defense had big stops, big plays. That really wasn't the case yesterday yesterday. That really was not a case on, on, on Sunday night at AT&T Stadium. It, it wasn't. Now, now I know that one of those touchdowns for, for LSU was a defensive touchdown, mm-hmm. but still, Miami did not look good. Offensively, they didn't look good. They had no running game. They had no running game. Rozier did not look sharp. Um, he, he, he didn't at all. He had a couple of deep balls that he, that he had that looked good that mm-hmm. he connected on, but some of the simple passes over the middle, literally throwing it straight to LSU, whether it was guys in the wrong place on the receiving end, or he was just feeling pressure and throwing it away. I'm not sure, but he, he didn't look good on a number of plays. Again, mm-hmm. there were a couple of plays where he had some, some really good balls that he threw, but a lot, he we talked about Shea Patterson not looking comfortable. Rozier scored two touchdowns, mm-hmm. but he still did not look comfortable. Yeah, and I mean, for me, you look at it, and the only reason why, and I know LSU fans are going to say, come on, guys, really? You're going to you're gonna sit here and talk about how it's Miami playing bad. That's the reason we won. It's not the reason they won. Like, LSU did play well, but I mean, the thing that only opens up this question to me, is the offense where it's like, yeah, Brosep was phenomenal, but Burrow was not. But you've already said, like, you compared it game manager is what you said, which is right on. And that really opens up this question. And I just, I feel like with LSU and Miami, is this going to be a true barometer to how they are for the rest of this year? Because, like, the thing that you love and hate about week one is you're kind of finding out who your team is like Penn state is Penn state really a bad team because they almost lost to Appalachian state. No, they probably came out. Let's be honest. Appalachian state doesn't get you hard in the morning and they just went out and were like, Hey, you know what? This is any other game. And Appalachian state was ready to play and almost did what they did to Michigan against Penn State. Like, I sit here and I think with LSU, if they want to make a statement for if they are real this year, make it on September 15th. Go into Auburn, get that W. Tiger v. Tiger, get that W. Throw a wrench into that college football playoff because they know what happens. If they win that game on September 15th, We are probably talking about, and I mean we as in like everyone in the college football universe, are talking about whether or not they can win their side of the SEC because then it's just Alabama. And with Alabama, if Auburn beats them and maybe someone else upsets them, then you might have a shot. I don't think they lose three games. Hell, I don't even think they lose two games this year. But anything can happen. They almost lost two last year. Just ask Mississippi State. But I mean with... LSU, if you want to really make a statement, make a statement on the 15th. And kind of to go along with the last thing I was going to say about their schedule is the thing I really like is you were mentioning like, yeah, you get Georgia, Mississippi State, Alabama, home, home, home. But look at their road games. Not not one of them touches another one. They have no back-to-back road games. Every single road game, it's, all right, we're going to go to Auburn, all right, now we come back for two at home. All right, we're going to go to Florida. All right, we come back for three at home. Oh, we're going to go to Arkansas. Hey, we get to come back home to play Rice before we go to Texas to end the year. And another thing is if you look at, like you mentioned, the home, home, home for the big three, Georgia, Mississippi State, and Alabama, you'll notice between October 20th and November 3rd, that's more than seven days. So they get Georgia at home. They get Mississippi State at home. Oh, then we get a full bye week to prepare for Alabama. So basically going into Alabama, not only is that a home game for LSU, you now get two weeks 
to prepare for the biggest team in your conference. Yeah, I think that that's that's important to have that. I think that'll be it'll be interesting to see how that that schedule dynamic goes mm-hmm. for LSU. They lost Adrian McGee, their right tackle, in in the game against Miami with what they're saying is a pretty severe injury. I haven't seen anything else about it, but it'll be interesting to see how if that plays into anything in the offensive in the offensive line, mm-hmm. uh, because of course we saw Nick Brosette, like we've mentioned a number of times now play really well mm-hmm. play really well and, and be really the focal point of the of the offense in week one they need to be able to continue to do that and I think any injury to your offensive line no matter who it is center guard tackle whatever you never want to see that it it, it it a lot of times can mess with the chemistry that's going on there but you just hope that he's going to be okay and that the offensive line will continue to to produce and open up holes for for Brosset to be able to run. I I think that both of these teams we we look at both of them. Miami was really good last year. They had a really poor end. LSU was pretty darn good last year. They had a wonderful end to their season. Mm-hmm. And Miami comes out and they continue to be similar to to what the end of their season looked like last year. LSU comes out, continues to be similar to the end of their year last year. I think these two teams are actually going to go in different directions. I don't think they're both going to be on the same path. I think LSU is going to be on a path that goes uh, in a direction that they will will see themselves climb the top 25 this season. I'm not saying that they're going to beat Alabama, and I'm not going to say that they will beat Auburn. But I think that they're going to be a competitive team, especially if we see the same type of team, and especially if Joe Burrow was able to get involved in this offense more than what he was against Miami mm-hmm. and actually, you know, not have the Mitch Trubisky effect of, well, we'll let you throw it a little bit, but not too much where, you know, you might look bad. Be able well, to, like, break loose from that and and stretch the field and move the ball down the field. That's going to be important. But then for Miami, Miami now, they already have one loss. They If they play like they did mm-hmm. – with Malik Rozier not looking comfortable, making poor decisions, throwing the ball away, having it be interceptions, interceptions returned for touchdowns, Miami will not thrive this season. And if their defense lets up that many points on a consistent basis, they will not thrive this season. Well, and the one thing I do want to clarify, when you say the Mitch Trubisky effect, you're talking about NFL Mitch Trubisky, not college. Oh, Mitch I'm Trubisky. absolutely talking about NFL Mitch yeah. Trubisky, which is just, what, I, in terms of what the, in terms of, I'll, I'll clarify, in terms of what the mm-hmm. Bears did for him last year, where they did not open the playbook. Yep. They did not allow him to do much of anything because they wanted to coddle him and make sure that he wasn't ruined in year one when they knew they weren't going to be good. So that's what happened. Here with LSU, they wanted to, it seemed like they wanted to make sure that Joe Burrow wasn't going to be too overwhelmed in game one against Miami and that uh, he wouldn't be doing any more than than what uh, they may have expected from him in in week one. I think that now that they have this week one game over and they played really well and they liked what they saw from him, Ed Orgeron liked what he saw from uh, from Burrow, I think it's now opened the playbook a little bit more each and every week. Well, and the reason I wanted to clarify is might be college fans watching this more than NFL and they're going, well, Brandon, it, 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 in North Carolina State, Mitch wasn't like that at all talking about the bear side. But the last thing I'll say is LSU, their upset ability, their upset special meter rises a little bit after this win against Alabama and Auburn. The reason why it rises with Alabama, they're at home against Alabama. They will have a bye week before Alabama. That one, though, will fluctuate throughout the season. We will see what we get to at that game. For Auburn, I... I think the upset special is high. If there is more of a chance to upset Alabama or Auburn, Auburn is on upset special alert. That could be an upset special in a week's time when we are making the picks for week three next week. But this is where you guys come in. Let us know what you think down below in that comment section. What do you think about LSU after the first game against Miami? What do you think about Miami after the first game against LSU? And with LSU, will they or could they upset Alabama or Auburn this season in the SEC. Let us know what you think down below 
in that comment section. And Brandon, let's close out. Well, not close out the podcast. We still got our picks coming up next if you're on podcast services around the world. If you're on YouTube, we've already done them, so you can go ahead and see them. But our last real topic for the week is looking ahead at a game that will be going on this week. Right now, Clemson is still number two. We'll see if that changes. Probably not in the rankings that will come out tomorrow because I will say that kind of a PSA aside, not really a PSA, just an aside to you guys. That's the only thing I hate about this first week of the college football season is usually because games end on Saturday, usually then Sunday they come out with the rankings. Well, because of that one game today between – Virginia Tech and Florida State rankings aren't going to come out until the day after we do our podcast. So even our picks are kind of messed up with the top 25 because we're using last week's top 25 because the new one has not come out yet. But we are looking at the game between the Clemson Tigers and the Texas A&M Aggies. And in their first game, I mean, they both didn't play anybody of any real significance where Furman went into Death Valley they lost 48 to 7 and then you had um northwestern state go into college station they lost 59 to 7 and everyone was all crazy about the texas a and aggies on thursday night look at how good they look under jimbo fisher they look so good look at this and i'm sitting there going look at who they're playing like come on they're going to get their first real test this week The interesting thing with Clemson, though, Brandon, is something that we might have predicted might be coming to flourishing as it looks like both Trevor Lawrence and Kelly Bryant will play in the second game of the year for the Clemson Tigers this week against the Aggies. I'm going to ask you, though, with everything going on with this game, will the Aggies upset the Tigers this weekend? No. No, they will not. Uh, A big part of why the Aggies played so, so well against Northwestern State, other than the fact that it was Northwestern State, Mm -hmm. was that they ran the ball 61 times for 503 yards and five touchdowns. If you did that against Clemson, I would fall down. (laughs) <laughs> pass like passed out. I mean, I as I think many other people mm-hmm. would, all every single Clemson fan would have to go out and get a new TV because it would be broken. I mean, that is not gonna happen. It would be broken. That is not gonna happen against this against this Clemson team. There's no way. Uh, Clemson last week they gave up only 117 yards on the ground against mm-hmm. again Furman. I get it, but. That's just that's just not going to happen. I mean, you you had your 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 top guys, your your um, Christian Wilkins and uh, Clellan Farrell, who had sack, tackle for a loss, number of tackles. It was, you know, your your top guys on on your top defense were mm-hmm. definitely showing up, and and they'll show up against Texas A and M as well. I I don't actually think this game will be all that close. It'll be fun to talk about because of the. Of the rivalry because it's you know uh, Jimbo and and this and that and you know you know stuff like that. I think it'll be it'll be fun to to talk, but um, once it comes down to it, once the game is played, I don't think that we're going to see uh, anything that we weren't expecting to see. Mm-hmm. Quite honestly, I really don't. Uh, I I think Clemson did on their end, and again, we've talked about it so many times already on this podcast. Neither team, Clemson nor Texas A&M, were, were really, truly tested at all. But Clemson's passing game, they look great. Trevor Lawrence looks like the real deal. And Trevor Lawrence looks like he's going to be unseating Kelly Bryant. Well, and that's the thing I was going to say. The thing that I find funny is you look at both Bryant and Lawrence, they have kind of similar numbers in some sense, like, Lawrence only goes 9 of 15. If he would have threw one more pass and completed it, it would have been 10 of 16 like Kelly Bryant was. Lawrence only had 10 more yards through the air than Bryant. But the thing that jumps out to me, and some people may say, well, Ricky, it might be situations in the game, but against Furman, who both quarterbacks had their time against Furman, Kelly Bryant only scored one touchdown. Trevor Lawrence scored three touchdowns and they scored on every all five of the drives that he was in there Mm -hmm. they scored on every single one with Lawrence and let's just go back to the first segment for a second one of the big things you 
criticized Michigan and Shea Patterson for was not putting points up on the board. Last time I checked, if I replay the tape from that segment, you win games by scoring points. Boom. Thanks, John Madden. Lawrence should be your starter. Like, there is no reason why Taylor Lawrence shouldn't be the starter against Clemson. What I am kind of thinking for this one is, this is what I'm thinking. Does Texas A&M have a shot to upset Clemson? Yes. And the reason why I say yes is because... You want to be nice. No, no, no. It's not just that. It's you can take, like, it's any given Saturday. Look at what with Penn State and Appalachian State. Number two, it's at Texas A&M. It's in College Station. Right there, move the football over a little bit to the Texas A&M side. However, my X factor for this game is that Clemson defense. If Clemson's defense wasn't what it was coming into this year, I may go with an upset special in this one. But who I knows? Can't. Maybe you still I can't do. Go? Uh, no, I'm spoiling it. I can't go against Clemson. I wanted to. I was coming into this podcast. I was like, I'm picking Texas A&M. And then I was thinking about it. And after you said defense, I went, hey, they do have a pretty good defense. That's how I talk in my head. And I was like, I can't go against the Clemson Tigers. I can't in this one. However, I'm not saying the Aggies don't have a shot to because – if they played like they if they play anywhere near like they did last week, then they'll have a shot. Am I saying they're gonna have the same amount of production on the ground in the same exact game? No. But if Mond can play well, if Starkle can play well, if they play both of them, if um Travion Williams, like he blew up on Thursday night. It's like if you didn't know who Travion Williams was coming into this college season. You found out in that game. And I'm not saying he's going to have near 250 yards, but if he can provide a solid rushing presence and this offense can wear down that defense of Clemson, get this crowd into the game, then those are the ingredients for an upset in College Station. The thing that I'm thinking, though, in this one is Clemson gets the win, but I will say on the Clemson side, Kelly Bryant will struggle. Trevor Lawrence will shine. They'll win the game closer than people think because of Trevor Lawrence. He will win the job going into the rest of the season. I, I think that's an, an easy thing to, to say. And I, I, Trevor Lawrence should have been the starter on opening mm-hmm. uh, in the opening game. Like he, just, he should have only played. Like Kelly Bryant shouldn't have played until it was like 55 to 2. I'll be honest with you. Thanks, Kelly Bryant, but there's no need for you anymore. Mm-hmm. It's time for Trevor Lawrence to do his thing. He's the better quarterback, mm-hmm. and that's what you want. You want to be playing the better player. Kelly Bryant was serviceable, and that's what I've been saying the entire time. I, I really wasn't all that thrilled with him last year. He was okay, but, I mean, anyone's going to say that uh, you know he's okay and be able to get them to the college football playoff. They're mm-hmm. going to say, well, he's better than okay. You got to the college football no, I mean you. You had again your defense. Clemson thrives one, on their on their defense. Defense, one of the top coaches in college football. It's like it wasn't just your quarterback. Exactly, but I think this year their mm-hmm. defense, which is grade A, grade A plus, to go with Trevor Lawrence, an outstanding quarterback, to go with a running game that can can you know move the ball. Etn can move the ball. Feaster, uh, he only had three carries, but he can move the ball. Mm-hmm. Um, and I, I think that that's. Those are pieces for a recipe for success. And another thing, going to Texas A&M, they held the ball for 41 minutes in that game against Northwestern State. 41 Mm -hmm. minutes. Northwestern State didn't even have it for 20. That is not going to happen against Clemson. They are not going to have the ball that long. They're not going to hold the ball for 41 minutes in the ballgame. That's not going to happen. And uh, Clemson's defense is the real deal. If the, again, I I just a big piece of why Texas A&M did so well is because of their running game. They scored five touchdowns on the ground. They had over five hundred yards. That that is not going to happen. Clemson is going to be able to put a lot of pressure on their offensive line. Mm-hmm. They're going to win the battle in the trenches. They they are not going to succeed by running the football. Texas A&M, I don't think. 
So they're going to have to turn to the air, and a lot more pressure will be put on Kellen Mond. I also got a little bit of ammunition for the people that you might have said might have gone against you with the Kelly Bryant thing, where, oh, he's a good quarterback. He got us to the college football playoff. Yeah, but with Clemson, getting to the college football playoff is not the problem. It's what do you do once you're there. When you have a quarterback on the same level of Deshaun Watson, yeah, they lost, but you put 40 points up against Alabama, and you lost, but you almost beat them in that year. The next year, with Deshaun Watson, you put 35 points up on them, and you win by four points. Last year, with Kelly Bryant, you go up against Alabama, you put six points on the board, and you lose 24-6 to six in a game that nobody watched after that Georgia-Oklahoma <laughs> game. Like people, Do you remember that game? People started to watch it, and then people were like, like, people were starting to watch, like, oh, my God, if we get a game anywhere near up, well, this one's boring. And then they walked out of the room. They're do, like, I'm going to go get dinner. Do you remember that, though? Exactly. We, we watched yeah. it. I mean, you, as mm-hmm. you and I watch a lot of the, the, the games mm-hmm. together and stuff. and It was we, a we, thrilling we, Rose Bowl, and then they yes. Pfft, Yes, kind of I mean we were so ball. excited. I was I was coming over to your mm-hmm. house so excited after that after that that Georgia Oklahoma game. It was couldn't like, remember wow, couldn't wow, remember that was anything nice. of it. And then you you got the mm-hmm. you got the the clunker with Clemson the Clemson clunker because yeah, um, we were expecting part three, but yeah. Deshaun Watson wasn't there. But I really do think to your point, Ricky, mm-hmm. with Trevor Lawrence, Clemson may have the their national they, they may have their national title team mm-hmm. right there. With Trevor Lawrence at the helm, with this defense, with a very above-average running game, serviceable wide receivers, mm-hmm. this is a team that should have no problem making it to the playoffs, and this is a team that everyone should fear in the playoffs. Well, and that's the main reason why in this one I say the Aggies are not going to upset the Clemson Tigers because... Like I said, I already kind of gave my prediction of it, but like, I don't think Kelly Bryant does super well in this one, and I think it's one of those. Even if he starts the game, I know that, um, like the whole Nick Saban thing, like, oh, I don't know who's gonna start, kind of a thing. If Kelly Bryant starts it, it's not gonna, it's gonna be short lived, and for me, it's gonna be wow, he's struggling against this Texas A and M team. Hey, get Lawrence in there, and Lawrence is gonna come in. He's gonna command that offense. Will he have a ton of year, yards? Maybe not, but the one thing he's going to be able to do, and like you said, on five, I believe it was what you said, five drives that he was in, they scored on every one. He's going to be able to, maybe if he doesn't do that same thing and like maybe one of those drives they don't score, he's going to get into the end zone, though, with this offense a lot more than Kelly Bryant. And for me, it's going to be, the only thing that kind of the the main thing Clemson has to do is take the wind out of the sails of Texas A and M early because it is on the road. Basically, what Clemson has to do, and they should they know this. Dabo Sweeney knows this. It's not like I'm saying anything profound and like ooh insider information that no one knows about. But they have to come out. They have to set the tone. They basically have to take those fans at College Station out of the game. Take the wind and the everything out of that stadium so that you can thrive. If you start giving Texas A&M some momentum, if you let those fans stay in it, then that's where it might get a little chippy for or a little bit of a closer game than some might think for Clemson if they let those fans at College Station stay in the game by giving the Aggies some momentum. Yeah, I think you're right. I think Clemson has to come right in and just put a, you know, put up points right away. Mm -hmm. Put up points right away. Because this isn't Kevin Sumlin, Texas A&M. This ain't eight wins and we're happy. This is Jimbo Fisher we're talking about. (laughs) I think that, that, again, the storyline will be Jimbo Fisher – and, uh, you know, him coming back and, and, and the rivalry that used to be, mm-hmm. that, that, that used the, to be with him ACC and Dabo rivalry. Sweeney. Yeah, the, the ACC rivalry there when he was at Florida State. But there is there is not going to be much that I think goes past that mm-hmm. um, that point mm-hmm. alone for there to be any more talk about how this could, could be some, some sort of rivalry be, because – Clemson just seems to have better players, and for anyone that's saying, "Well, Brandon and Ricky, you guys didn't get all you know ex- ex- 
excited and stuff like that when, uh, you know, teams were playing other, you know, schools and, and, and stuff. You know, like the Kyle Clemson played Furman, and we talked about, oh, Clemson's, they're really going to be the mm-hmm. – but everyone already had Clemson pegged as being a, a, a playoff team. Yeah. It's 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 Clemson. It's the Clemson Tigers. A perennial powerhouse yeah, this year. Exactly. And I, and I think that you, what I'm more excited about is the fact that Trevor Lawrence came into that ball game and he – was outstanding. Mm-hmm. There really was no struggle from him. Now, I don't think that Trevor Lawrence is the next coming of Christ mm-hmm. by any means and that everything he does is going to be amazing and he will not throw an interception, he will not have a fumble, he will not have a mistake. He'll falter but at he, some point. I mean, he's a freshman. He's a true freshman. Mm-hmm. He will have his his moments where Davo's going to have to pull him inside and say, okay, it's not what we wanted. This is how it has to be done. This is how mm-hmm. you got to do it, stuff like that. That is normal. But Trevor Lawrence is on a better traje- trajectory path than Kelly Bryant will be ever. Mm-hmm. And that's why if you're Clemson, if you're if you're Dabo Sweeney, you want to play the best players that you can. That's why you get them. That's why you go and recruit them. Trevor Lawrence is that guy. Mm-hmm. You've seen that now. And again, it is very important to – you don't have to be – Trevor Lawrence doesn't have to be the one that throws the touchdown each drive. There just has to be points that come out of them because of how he led them down the field. That's what the important thing is, and that's what he showed this past weekend against Furman. Let me put it this way. In, I'm going to compare it to kind of like in, I think it was the LSU segment, you compared it to NFL Mitch Trubisky. I'm going to compare it to NFL New York Jets. The Jets had a decision this year. Do we go with Sam Darnold, the young rook, who will be starting Monday night, against the Detroit Lions, or do we go with the proven kind of journeyman veteran of Josh McCown? And they went with the young rook. They're going to start Sam Darnold because the ceiling for Sam Darnold is higher than Josh McCown. Journeyman quarterback, third overall pick in the draft rookie. Like, that's where the ceilings are, even though McCown... The floor might be here, whereas Darnold's floor might be here just because of where they are in their career. That's what Clemson is facing right now. Yes, Kelly Bryant might be here while Trevor Lawrence is here, slightly above Trevor Lawrence. But the ceiling, which is the roof, by the way, is higher for Trevor than it is for Kelly. And that's why I think that eventually, maybe after this game, hopefully after this game, Trevor then is the starter, so then Clemson can move on knowing, all right, this is our starting quarterback because if you look at their schedule, it's not quite like Michigan where they're playing, boom, right away in week three, but it's like you got Texas A&M this week that I'm going to say it like it could be an upset. without If that defense wasn't what it was, I might be switching over and making an upset special. The defense, but thank is, God the defense yeah, is the what defense it is. is the only thing that is still making me say yes, Clemson will win for sure. But I can't count out an upset from the Texas A and M Aggies. But the good thing for Clemson is they get Georgia Southern the week after. Then they play their tough game against Georgia Tech. And how I think everything is going to play out, and this is how I'll end it before I let you give your final thoughts, is. In this game against Texas A&M, it's either going to go one of two ways. It's either going to go the way of if an upset happens, Texas A&M rolls from the start, the crowd never gets out of the game, and Texas A&M wins it close. Or what I think will happen, Kelly Bryant will start, he will struggle, Trevor Lawrence will come in, the defense will keep Clemson in the game, Trevor Lawrence will come in, they'll start scoring, bing, 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 take the fans out of the game, run away with it, and they'll win probably a 2-3 score game. Then in week three, all right, Trevor Lawrence is our starter. They blow out Georgia Southern. And then with a full game under his belt, Trevor Lawrence will be prepared to start at Georgia Tech in Clemson's fourth game. That's kind of how I see the next game and then two games this season kind of going for Clemson and kind of their quarterback situation. I think you could be right there. Davo Sweeney already said that both quarterbacks are going to get playing time this week against Texas A&M. So uh, I'm assuming it'll be Bryant that probably starts. Mm -hmm. And I I think that kind of what you said, the kind of plan that you put together, 
I think it makes sense. I think that's similar to what we probably will see. And I, I, I think that Trevor Lawrence sooner than later will be the starting quarterback for the Clemson Tigers and, and he'll be taking this team for the rest of the season. Anything else you feel like we should mention before we uh, move on into our picks for this year? I know we talked a lot about but for this week. I, I know I know we talked a lot about Clemson in this one. Texas A&M, while I think that they will probably lose this game, I think that Texas A&M will be an improved team this season, and they will look better for their fans. Mm-hmm. Uh, Jim, having Jimbo Fisher at the helm, and I think working with Kellen Mond, who did look good last week against Northwestern State, this this team is they will be better. Uh, they have been perennially, it seems like eight and five for a number of years now, but. They will be picking themselves, I think, out of that hole and, and, and getting better very soon. Well, this is where you guys come in. Let us know what you think down below in that comment section. Will the Aggies upset the Clemson Tigers? Could they upset the Clemson Tigers? And how do you see this quarterback situation playing out for Clemson this week and then into the future? Let us know what you think down below in that comment section. And, Brandon, it's time to close out the podcast, making our picks like we do every single week and if you're on youtube you're like guys i'm seeing you first why am i seeing the end of the podcast first and that's because we put our picks out first so you guys can see them all before the week comes up we got a before saturday game coming up we're starting off with a friday game how we do it is this we pick the top 25 matchup so if it has a top 25 team in it we will pick that game as of right now because we record the podcast on mondays we are both sitting at 18 and 3 from last week. Tonight's game between Virginia Tech and Florida State will decide who had a better record after week one. Ricky, who's going VT. Brandon, who went with Florida State. One of us will be 19 and 3. The other one will be 18 and 4 after week one of the college football season. Also, how we do it is we go off of for our upsets, we go off of ranking. Not the line, although for some of the games I will put out what the line is and who is favored. And I'm trying to think of if I'm forgetting anything else as a base of what I need to explain for these picks. But let's get right into it. If I am, it'll come to me. But the first one, let's get right into it. TCU going up against SMU. What do you got, B? Got to go with TCU. They looked pretty good this past week. And uh, I think that'll carry, carry in again. Uh, for for this week against SMU and and, and I was just gonna say too a lot of these That's first a, couple of week things I remembered it's, it it's it's a lot of you know I want to say easy teams but most of these teams that we're talking about in the top twenty five are playing more cupcake level teams and uh, it, it doesn't provide a whole lot of upset opportunities TCU That's what I was gonna mention that this video if you're looking for ones with a lot of upsets you may not find it this week with the upset special and our buttons, but I'm going with TCU as well. There's no way they get the loss against SMU on Friday. Then we've got our Saturday games. Wisconsin playing host to New Mexico. The Badgers are a 35-point favorite. If Jonathan Taylor was anything like he was in Week 1, they will surpass that, and you should take the over on that line I've got the Badgers in Camp Randall all day, all, all day, every day with the win. Yeah, I got to go with Wisconsin. They looked so good in week one, and, and I think that we're going to see a whole lot of that throughout the season. And then moving on, another Big Ten team. We've got Michigan playing host to Western Michigan. The Broncos may not be rowing the boat anymore, Brandon, as P.J. Fleck is no longer there. They may not have Corey Davis catching passes for him, but – what do you think happens in this one? The Wolverines, 27.5-point favorites. I, I think that, that Michigan's going to have a, a big bounce-back week this week. I think Shea Patterson will figure things out. He'll look a lot more comfortable, have a lot more time, and uh, his week two game, his week two stats will look a whole lot better than his week one stats. Now, here's an interesting one. The next one we've got, and the reason why I say interesting is I don't know – who sets the lines in Vegas? Like, who's the guy that's like, this is the magical line for it? But we've got Mississippi State going up against Kansas State, and they're going to be going against each other in Manhattan, Kansas. And the line is Mississippi State 
by eight and a half. And my only thought is how is Mississippi State not a bigger favorite than almost a touchdown, barely a touchdown, is what they are a favorite of. They beat Stephen F. Austin 33-6 to last week. Kansas State barely escaped South Dakota 27-24. So for me, I see that line. I'm putting a bet on it right now. I'm going Mississippi State because they are totally going to beat Kansas State by more than eight and a half points this Saturday. Yeah, I've got to go with Mississippi State too. How is that line so low? Does that seem low to you too? Like I, I looked at that and I went, "How is that line so low?" It's a lot closer than what I would have than I would have expected. That's and for Nick sure. Fitzgerald's coming back too for the Bulldogs. So I mean, they're gonna have him coming back. Yeah, I get it's on the road, but I looked at that and I went, "Whoa, what are you doing?" Next game we've got. This was one that could have been an upset special, but UCLA. Not only did they lose Week One. They might not be without Wilton Spate. He was injured in the first half of that first game. They're going to be going up against Oklahoma in Norman, Oklahoma. 30-and-a-half point favorite for the Sooners. Who do you got, Chip Kelly and the Bruins or Lincoln Riley, who is now Sean Anderson's Twitter profile picture? Because that was the bet. If FAU lost, he had to do that. You going Oklahoma or you... C-L-A. Definitely going with Oklahoma. They looked explosive last week. I think they will be again this week. This was one, if you would have asked me like two months ago, I would have been like, yeah, I, I might pick that upset when the season gets there. Based off of week one, I cannot. Oklahoma rolled FAU, like completely rolled to where I thought that the Owls would put up some kind of a fight. Did I think they'd get blown out? Yeah. But I <laughs> thought it would be more of like a 38-14 to 14 kind of a game, and that's not... What we got this past weekend, I got to go with the Sooners. I think that they will continue to roll. The Bruins kind of banged up after week one, and we'll see how that affects their season. Then we got three cupcakes right in a row. I'm just going to list my three off, and then you can list your three off. Virginia Tech, William, and Mary. There's not even a line set for this one yet because, obviously, Virginia Tech hasn't played. Got to go with VT to beat William and Mary at home. Then Oregon playing host to Portland State. This is another one. Oregon, the Ducks, quack, quack, will win this game. And then I feel sorry for the Red Wolves of Arkansas State. They got to go into Tuscaloosa. I said Mobile earlier in the podcast. I don't know why you didn't correct me. Tuscaloosa I guess I obviously for wasn't listening. the Crimson Tide, and Alabama will beat Arkansas State. So I went a little rapid fire. What do you got for those three games? I, I believe we're both the same, though. Virginia Tech, Oregon, Alabama. Yeah, Real yeah. easy. A couple of cupcakes. Then we got one that could have been an upset special. It was not for myself. For the Georgia Bulldogs going into Charlotte or Columbia, South Carolina. They will play the Gamecocks of South Carolina. This is an interesting game early in the year because in our SEC preview, Sean did this one. There were Gamecock fans that believed that they are going to pull off the upset, and Vegas might be thinking the same as the Bulldogs are only a nine and a half point favorite going into this week two matchup. Well, don't knock uh, South Carolina for for anything because I think that they'll definitely be one of those teams that will be around in the SEC, one of those teams that will be an improved team for mm-hmm. sure, and I think that they will give Georgia a a contest. But I think that Georgia is ultimately going to be the one that comes out and wins it. Yeah, I'm the same way. I got Georgia in this one. They've got bigger things on the mind, and they are going to get the win against the Gamecocks. It might be closer than I'm thinking, but I would probably take the over for that 9.5 in this one. Then the next one, we've got Ohio State, whose offense put up some points. You had Haskins looking really good at the quarterback position last week for the Buckeyes. They are playing the Rutker Scarlet Knights who come into the game 1-0 and after winning in week one. They did not go at Rochino. They go with Arthur Sikowski, kind of a quarterback battle we were talking about in the offseason. Brandon, the Buckeyes, 35-point favorites in this one. Do the Scarlet Knights get the upset? Do you hit the button? No. No, absolutely not. <laughs> not a chance, not a chance, Brandon's in that <laughs> no, button. No, no, not not at all. O- Ohio State is is definitely going to get the win. They're not going to score 77 points like they did last week, but the Buckeyes will get the win. Yeah, I'm going to go to the same way. Ohio State in this one. And then next week will be a little bit of the test that they will face with TCU 
before Urban Meyer comes back to the team after week three. <clears throat> then the next, I'm going to go rapid fire again. I'll let you go first. The three games we got, Ball State, Notre Dame. That's in Notre Dame. Notre Dame's a 33.5 point favorite. North Dakota, Washington, Savannah State, Miami. Who you got in these three next games? Going to go with Notre Dame against Ball State. Um, in the in the second one, got to go with Washington. Washington really could have been one and zero. I mean, they mm-hmm. they really could have. They needed to do more offensively. They certainly did. But I I think that th- for the rest of the season, they're going to have a lot of success. They look good. The defense looks pretty good. Had a lot of good stops against Auburn, and uh, offensively. Browning was slow. He, he got off to a slow start, but he finally figured it out, and, and you take away one bad blemish on it with one really poor interception that should not have happened. Washington there. And then the third game, who was that again? Savannah State-Miami. Going to go with Miami. Miami's going to get a nice bounce back. This will be a game where hopefully uh, Malik Rozier is able to uh, figure it out and not be pressured as much mm-hmm. as... He was in the game against LSU. Uh, Got to go Miami. Yeah, I'm going to go the same three. Notre Dame going to get the win over Ball State. It's not even going to be close. And then the other two, too. Washington against North Dakota. Miami over Savannah State should be some easy wins for these teams early in the year. We got two more cupcake games where we've got West Virginia going against Youngstown State. I'm going to go with West Virginia to get the win in Morgantown. Then we've got... The national champion Golden Knights from UCF, they are going to play host to the South Carolina State. I will pick them to win as well. Who do you got in these next two with Youngstown State, West Virginia, South Carolina State, UCF? West Virginia, UCF. Well, and Brandon, not even going to mention that I uh, thrown out the national championship with uh, Central Florida for yet another week. Then an interesting one, 6 o'clock game. Do you hit the upset on this one? I think we already gave the answer, though, in the last segment. Clemson, Texas A&M, what are you thinking? I know we just went into a huge thing about it. I'm going Clemson. What about you? I'm going Clemson, too. The defense is just too good. Texas A&M last week had over 500 yards uh, of rushing on the ground. It's not going to happen again. Yeah, and the interesting thing is Clemson is a 13-point favorite. So, I mean, the Aggies have a chance to get the upset in this game. I almost picked it too. I was like, you, I'm gonna pick you know, the Aggies, and, and then you know why? Sense of reason. You know why? Came. It's because Jimbo Fisher is the head coach. That's the only exactly. reason. If it was Kevin Sumlin, still it'd be about 28. <laughs> not touching. <laughs> he, he lost the boy. He, not Boise State. He lost to BYU in his first game at Arizona. The funny thing, and I'll say this: out of all the Pac-12 coaches we talked about, remember the first years? Chip Kelly lost. Kevin Williams, or yeah, Kevin Williams lost. Herm Edwards, he got the win. He's the only one that got the win out of the first year head coach. Kevin Williams, yeah, I, Kevin Sumlin. Kevin Sumlin. I, I Kevin said Will- that. You said I Kevin was Williams. Looking like, at you. Was that another head coach? Like what? I was it's looking Kevin at Kevin Williams. I was looking at you like Kevin. I said it like <laughs> with that you questioning. You said it like Kevin Williams. Stop me if I'm wrong. And, and, <laughs> and I did. And I looked I at did. you. I looked at you the first time, and you were like. Blank stare. So I'm like, Kevin Williams must be right, even though I don't think that's right. And then it finally clicked in your head, Kevin Sullivan. But Herm Edwards, Uh. the only one getting the W out of the three of them last week. I found that interesting. But moving forward, more of these games. We're going to go rapid fire with three more. Southeastern Louisiana against LSU. If it takes me more than 20 seconds to say your name, you're not going to get the win. LSU with the W in that one. Florida State Sanford should be a... Good first win for Florida State in this one because they're going to lose tonight to Virginia Tech. Then you got Alabama State going into Auburn. I'm going to take Auburn in this one. So LSU, Auburn, Florida State all getting the wins. How about you? I'm doing the same thing, LSU, Florida State, and Auburn. And then we've got an interesting one. We've got Penn State and Pittsburgh. And the reason why I say interesting is because Penn State should have lost to Appalachian State. I firmly believe that um, because... They did not play like they did not play well enough, and that should have been a game that they handled and blew out, giving all the credit to Appalachian State in that one. Now they go up against a team in Pitt where Pitt could be an upset favorite in this one. I am not pushing the button. I'm gonna go with the Nittany Lions, but Penn State only an eight and a half point favorite at Heinz Field in Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania. 
I'm going to go with the Nittany Lions as well. I think you look at last week and you have to hope. You that... almost hit the button, though. You almost did when we were making these picks. Well, I, I look at it as, as Pitt is going to definitely try and pay, play spoiler to this. Mm-hmm. And, I mean, Pitt and Penn State, they've, they've got definitely history and, 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 and things like that. But Penn State is ultimately too good at the at the end of the day. They're better than what they showed last week. Their defense, you have to hope, is going to be better than what mm-hmm. they showed last week. Uh, McSorley was also slow to start that that game. I think that you know week one is under the belt. Penn State will will most likely get it back, but Pitt Pitt's going to give them a test. But I think Penn State's going to pass it. Well, and the next game we've got we've got Texas trying to get back on the winning wagon after losing to Maryland in game one. They will host Tulsa in Austin, Texas. I'm going with Texas to get the first win. How about you? I'm going to go with Texas as well. they got to stop scheduling Maryland, though, to start the season. I know, right? <laughs> I know. But the one thing I will say, very good class act from Texas to start the game. I loved it. Where they had the open yes. spot for um, O'Neal, and then they declined the penalty, yeah, that was, and it was a class act. It was act. great. Next game we got, this might be the only game we differ on. The Trojans, number 15th right now. This is going to change, obviously, after the Monday game. The Trojans going into Stanford, California to play the Cardinal. Cardinal are only three and a half point favorites. I am going to stick with the favorite in this one. I am going to go Stanford over USC, although I could have easily been persuaded to the other side of this one. USC is going to win. USC is going to win this one. They're going to go and they are going to. And as you threw it down, it still played. It still played it again because I just, forget about it. You know, USC is going to win this game. JT Daniels is going to come out and he's going to have another solid performance mm-hmm. and for the Trojans. And then they're going to look back at the game film and the tape from the game last week and figure out just exactly what you need to do to stop Bryce Love. They're going to find a way to do it. Bryce Love is n- maybe not going to be stopped for only 31 yards or whatever he had last mm-hmm. week, but he is not going to go off and explode against this USC defense. USC is going to get the win over the Cardinal. And the reason why I think I went with Stanford over U- USC is both these teams had terrible first halves against teams that they probably should have beat um, handily and they ended up being, but like UNLV and San Diego State – both of them kept it close against both the teams that they were playing. And then the Trojans and the Cardinal ran away in the second half. I think this is one where I like Stanford basically because their defense did better against San Diego State than USC's did against UNLV going with the Cardinal with the win. And then the last two, you got UConn winless on the year going into Boise State. Boise State's a 34-point favorite. I'm going to go with the Smurf Turf. To get the win against the Huskies. I love it. Going to go Boise State as well. And then the final game, this was one I almost hit the upset special button on, but I will decide not to, and I kind of want to. I'm not going to, but I kind of want to. You got Arizona State in Tempe, Arizona. They will be taking on Michigan State. Michigan State's only a a 6.5-point favorite, and the, the reason why I almost wanted to hit the upset special button on this one is Michigan State did not look like they were all together in that first game against Utah State. Probably should have lost against Utah State. Arizona looked Arizona State looked well in their first game. They looked well coached from Herm Edwards. Part of me wanted to go with Herm Edwards in this one, but I am going to go with I'm going to go against my gut. And I'm going to go with the Spartan and Sparty to get the win in Tempe, Arizona. I'm going to go with Michigan State for sure uh, in, in in this one. Michigan State, again, a, another team in the Big East that – the Big East. I keep saying just – I just keep throwing off the 10. <laughs> Big 10 East. The Big East does not exist in football. But – I used to. I, but it does not no, exist I know, anymore. I know. But uh, I, I'm, I'm going to go with them. I think that they're a much more talented team. I think they're also a much um, uh, more experienced team in, in what they've got. Uh, Arizona State, I, I, I don't think that they're they're at the level, same level 
uh, as Michigan State is, and, and the Spartans should get the win. And the one thing that uh, fans might have been able to hear is, uh, just like the August Patreon podcast, Brandon, which uh, everyone can check out at patreon.com backslash Mosville podcast for as low as $1 each month. Um, you might have been able to hear a little thunder as that one as a storm has kind of rolled right in um, to during our record time. And that last one, as you were talking, I kind of heard it and was like, ooh, that one was kind of loud. I wonder if that one will be picked up on the recording. But this is where you guys come in. Let us know what games you got this week, what games you're looking for, where are your upsets. I didn't have any this week. I know that there were a lot that I was like, oh, this could be an upset, but I didn't want to go with that one. That Arizona State one, I'm going to I'm gonna sit on that all week and be like, I should have picked Arizona State, especially when they uh, give me a loss because I picked uh, Michigan State. That's one that could definitely be an upset this week. But let us know what you guys have down below in the comment section. I want to thank you guys for checking out the Primetime Podcast, getting to talk a little college football for you guys, a little housekeeping here at the end. Make sure you check out patreon.com backslash Mosville Podcast. If you want to be like Matthew, thank you to Matthew for joining us today to talk a little bit Michigan Notre Dame. Make sure to get a T-shirt down below in the description. You can also get so at mostfellowpodcast.com where you can catch MVP each and every day. And then make sure to rate us five stars on iTunes and Apple Podcasts. Make sure that you tell everyone that Brandon and I are not a couple of good old boys that only talk about the SEC as I still believe that is the only comment that we have for the primetime podcast as of right now. Want to thank you guys for watching this on YouTube. Want to thank you guys for listening on podcast services around the world. And as always, have a good day, everybody.